reading from Psalm 66, 16 to 17. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. This is a reading from Mark 5, 1 to 20. It's also our sermon passage. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke, them, he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs, and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him, that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has, how he has had mercy on you. And so he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. It's good to see you all. We continue on in our series in Mark, and we're seeing how Jesus is building a better kingdom. He's building the kingdom of God. And today in our text, we see the first missionary, if you will, or perhaps even church planter in the New Testament. And it's a Gentile man who's possessed by demons. <laughs> Uh, what we're going to see today is this. Uh, Jesus' kingdom is going forward, and because his kingdom is going forward, we are those who are to tell out what the Lord has done for us. Jesus' kingdom, it's going forward, and we are those who are telling out what the Lord has done for us. Now today we have not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six points all right, at least two of you are excited. All right. <laughs> uh, those six points are the inconvenience of the kingdom. Number two is the universalness of the kingdom. Number three, the power of the kingdom. Number four, the authority of the kingdom. Number five, the testimony of the kingdom. And lastly, responding to the kingdom. So inconvenience, universalness, power, authority, testimony, and response. Before we dig in, let's pray. Jesus, we pause and we pray because we need you. Even as we have sung earlier in the service, we need you. Send Holy Spirit. Spirit, come and not only just wake us up, but wake us up to your word that you would speak to us and that we would see the power of your salvation in our lives. So God, would you do that? We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So first, the inconvenience of the kingdom. Look at verse 1. 
they came to the other side of the sea. Now we need to remember what had happened just prior to the event. And what had happened was a storm, and not just a small storm, but a life-threatening storm. Uh, the disciples really thought that they were going to die. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 33, the disciples famously say, Jesus, don't you care? <laughs> don't you care that we're going to perish? Now, whenever one has a near-death event, what do you typically do? So, for example, say you were nearly you know, dead in a car accident. What do you do? Uh, typically, you recover. Um, you take it easy. At least you have a little bit of rest. Now, it's seemingly absurd how Jesus does the opposite of what typically is done in those events. He goes from the near-death storm to the crazed, demon-possessed man in a graveyard. I just want to put before you, look at what's going on. This is not the right time for mission. The disciples are physically exhausted. They've just been rowing to save their lives. They are, you could even say, emotionally exhausted. They were fearing for their lives. They are spiritually exhausted because they're trying to figure out who is this Jesus who just calmed the terrible storm by a word. It's also not the right place. Come on, a graveyard in a Gentile land? That's creepy and it's not kosher. All right. But also, it's not the right person. This guy is possessed by demons. And you might be saying, come on, Jesus, come on. What are you thinking? There's a principle here. You know what, if we wait for the right moment for missions, if we wait for the right moment to like basically tell out what God has done in our lives, if we wait for the right moment to witness, it really happens. Just because it's not convenient doesn't mean it's not the right time to witness. What we see here is that any moment, even the worst moment, is a perfect moment for witness. Number two, the universalness of the kingdom. Continue, verse one. Where do they go? They go to the Gerasenes area. This is the non-Jewish part of what's called the Sea of Galilee. So they're on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And we know it's a Gentile area because there's a large herd of pigs and the Jews don't do the pig thing. All right, now why is this important? The kingdom of God is not just for the Jews, but the kingdom of God is for all who will have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of our tradition in our church is we have what's called the Apostolic Creed or the Apostles' Creed. And one of the lines in the Apostles' Creed is, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, when we use that word Catholic, that word Catholic actually means universal, not the Roman Catholic Church. And so when we're declaring that, we're saying, God, I believe that your church is for all the world. God, you are building a kingdom out of all peoples everywhere. There's a principle here. Whoever you think is the least likely person to become a follower of Jesus, it is totally possible that they can become a follower of Jesus. Let me put it in practical terms. Let's give an example first. The New Testament. So we have something in the Bible that's called the New Testament, and it's largely letters from a guy called the Apostle Paul. Now, who was the Apostle Paul? Now, we know him as this great Christian man who wrote many Christian letters in the New Testament, but prior to that, he was the great persecutor of the church. He was the one who actually was trying to destroy the church. If you were there in that day and you were to say, who is the least likely person to become a follower of Jesus? You would have said, Paul. In fact, that's what we see. Paul does convert, and uh, he goes to Jerusalem, and the people are like, that can't be real. This must be a ruse. There is no possible way that this guy, the Apostle Paul, has become a follower of Jesus. He is the least likely person. And thankfully, there was a guy named Barnabas who said, it's real, and he brought him in to the church. Friends, do we see what this is saying? You know what? You know the mean neighbor? We all have mean neighbors. We do. God can save that person. Um, you know your friend who's part of the wrong political party? God can save that person. 
a little bit more seriously. Um, you know your skeptical sibling who tends to rib you over your faith? God can save that person. Or even a bit more tenderly, you know the abusive parent or even the abusive spouse. God can save that person. You know the person who is wrestling with addictions, the person who is locked in destructive patterns. God can save that person. Even the person who seems to be demon-possessed God can save that person. What we see here, it's all nations, all languages, all social economic backgrounds, all backgrounds. Jesus is building a universal kingdom. It's good news. The third point, the power of the kingdom. Here in this text, and one of the things that stands out is you have a very pathetic picture of this man. It's just amazing. Here he is, he lives among the tombs. He's bound with shackles, with irons, and he's always breaking them. I mean, look at verse 5. This is, often makes me cry because of the, the picture here. Night and day, he's always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Some of you can relate. In our own culture, we have um, this phenomena of cutting. And there's many reasons why people cut. The main reason, according to psychologists at least, is it's a way of release. It's a person who says, you know what, there's so much bad happening in my life. When I do this one little bad, at least it's one way that I can control all the stuff that's happening to me. Now, we don't know what's going on in this man's life, why he's cutting, but what we do see is this is a man who is in pain. This is a man who is in misery. This is a man who is lonely. This is a man who is tortured. What's the source of all this? Look at verse 2. It's an unclean spirit. Now, an unclean spirit is basically the New Testament's way of saying this is a man who is demon-possessed. Now, as soon as we say demon-possessed, some people might be saying, what? Okay, where are we going? There's much that we can say about demon possession, but what we want to do is be, be very simple here. What does the text affirm? It really happens. Sometimes people are possessed by demons. And also when we look at the rest of the scriptures, when a person is possessed by demons, it is always harmful, it is always destructive. Now we need to pause just for a little bit here because modern people, modern people are not comfortable with the idea of evil let alone even the idea of demons, the idea of evil spirits. And so the modern world will say something like this, you know, the wrong that we see in people, the wrong in the world, if you will, the brokenness of the world, it comes from natural causes. And so all the stuff that we see that we would call evil is actually a result of things such as, well, the medicine has just not been good enough for them. Uh, perhaps they had a wrong upbringing. Perhaps they just did not have a good enough education. And so we can try to explain away why there is so much evil in the world. The problem is, though, is it doesn't really explain what's going on. You see, when you look at the world, we have now greater efforts than ever where we are trying to bring people up the right way. We now have greater efforts than ever to educate our people. We now have greater efforts than ever to provide medicine, not just for physical, but even mental issues, ailments, disease. And so what we can say is this, you know what? People are not getting better despite our best efforts. In fact, some might even argue we're getting worse. Why is that? The Bible at least says there is evil. There is something called evil. Now, some of you, if you're in the science world, there's a guy named Stephen J. Gold. Now, Stephen J. Gold, he's now deceased. He passed from cancer. Um, he is probably one of the most preeminent, uh, um, if you will, evolutionary biologists um, who is credible and compassionate. He was uh, just a, a really profound guy. And um, he's not a Christian guy, okay? Um, he's a Jewish background, and he would call himself atheist. He was on an airplane coming from Europe 
to the United States uh, when 9-11 happened. Uh, for those of you who are much younger, 9-11 is when the Twin Towers uh, were collapsed in New York City and other things happened in our country. It's one of the most, most defining terror attacks in our world. So during 9-11, Stephen Jay Gold's on an airplane and he's supposed to land actually in New York City, but he can't because everything is shut down. And so he was one of those people who was diverted to Canada and he needed to spend, I think it was like two or three days there. So I like to read science and I was actually reading some of his memoirs, some of his letters after he passed from cancer. And in one of the letters, he writes about what he started to think through as he watched the news feed after 9-11. And one of the things he said was quite profound. He said, as I see all this senseless destruction, I cannot help but think that there is something literally called evil in this world that science can't explain. There is evil in this world. And the Bible says, yes, <laughs> there is evil. There are demons, and even the devil exists. And this evil is behind the brokenness of our world. As we look at this man, this man is possessed not just by one demon, but by many. Look at verse 9. The Lord Jesus asks him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion. Now, Legion in that time was like a Roman company of about 6,000 soldiers. And so this is a man who literally has thousands of demons within him. And now we can understand verse 3. No one can control him. That's why shackles are useless on him. He is completely wild. Now let's put this into the context. In chapter 4, which we saw just prior to this, there's this completely untamable storm. It's the storm of storms. It's wild. And here in chapter 5, here is a completely untamable man. He is completely wild. Now, as Jesus spoke to the untamable storm, it stilled, it became tame. And here in the text, Jesus speaks to the legion of demons and they depart. They are tamed. We need to see how the demons know the power of Jesus. Look at verse 6. They fall prostrate. This man falls prostrate before Jesus saying, I am in submission to you. Verse 7. Son of the Most High, do not torment us. They're basically saying, Jesus, we know who you are. You are the judge. You are the Son of God. You have the power. You have the power to even torment us. <laughs> Friends, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they are written in such a way to tell the story of Jesus, and they're telling the story of Jesus so that you will make a decision about who he is. They're basically saying, here is the story of Jesus. What will you do with him? Here in the text, we see Jesus has power over all evil. In fact, he has ultimate power, and the Gospels are saying, what will you do with this Jesus? If you are here and you are not yet a follower of Jesus, you would say, I am not a Christian. I'm non-Christian. We welcome you. We always want you to know that Cornerstone is a place where you can even say, I belong to this church family, even though I may not even believe yet. Because we want you to know that this is a safe, good place to figure out who is Jesus. So if you are here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, what I want you to see in the text is this. This is a clear statement that Jesus is God. He controls the demons. He is all-powerful. And what that means is he is more than a teacher, and it means that he has more than just power to kind of get you over the humps and the bumps of life. This Jesus has power to save and save even the what we call worst of people. So today the text is saying this, what will you do with this Jesus? Will you believe upon him? And more than believe, will you follow him? And will you trust him with your very life? There's a passage. Um, so in the New Testament, there's a book called James, and it's actually the brother of Jesus. And he has this verse. In chapter 2, verse uh, 19, it says, 
You believe that God is one good. Even demons believe that, and they shudder. What he's saying is this, you know what? Being spiritual, it's good, but it's not good enough. Believing that God is there is good, but it's not good enough. Not only must we believe that Jesus is God, but we must trust God to save us. And that's who Jesus is. He died upon the cross to take the full penalty of our sin. He takes the punishment that is due for my evil, for your evil, so that we could be with God forever. Here's a principle. Jesus has all power, power to save us from evil, from the curse, and even from sin itself. Now, our fourth point is the authority of the king. Look at verse 18. The healed man, he wants to come with Jesus. And I just want to point out, that's a sign of genuine conversion. When you have a person who wants to spend time with Jesus, that is saying, I am a new person. I want him. Now look at verse 19. How does Jesus respond? He says, no. He says, no. And what we see here is Jesus as the king, he has the right to say no to our best requests. He has authority over our lives. He decides what is best. We are his subjects. Now, some of you might be saying, I have a problem with that. <laughs> I have a big problem with that. Um, that really is intrusive on the freedom that I want. The reality is, is, as much freedom as we may want, when we are left to our freedom, we don't always make wise, good, healthy, life-giving decisions. Jesus is not some ogre. He is leading us in life. And so our freedom actually betrays that. But then someone might ask, okay, you, you got that one, but how can I know that I can trust Jesus? How do I know that he will actually lead my life well? He is a good king. And all that he does is to care for us always. Now, someone might say, okay, I don't get that. I mean, my life is awfully, awfully, awfully hard. How do I know that Jesus is trustworthy? We look to the cross. When we look to the cross, it's there that we see that Jesus died upon it for us and that he is the one out of goodness takes our sin, takes our shame, takes our burden upon himself. But not only that, Jesus is risen from the dead and he says he walks with us even today. And so though we walk through the storm, and this is what we saw last week, he is with us in the storm. So here's a principle. Jesus has all authority over your life, and he can say yes or no as he sees fit. We are to follow him because he loves us and he laid down his life for us. Now, number five is the testimony of the kingdom. Look at verse 19. Jesus says no, and then he gives them an instruction. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy upon you. This is a brilliant strategy. Uh, Jesus, as a Jew, knows that he has very little reach into this non-Jew area, and so he, cha he sends this changed Gentile man back into his Gentile country and Gentile people. You know what, friends? That is the same for us today. Who is the best one to reach your family? Who is the best one to reach your friends? Who is the best one to reach your co-workers? Who is the best one to reach your neighbors? You are. It's you. You know your friends. You know your family. You know your co-workers. You know your neighbors. And guess what? They know you. You are the best one. Part of the vision here at Cornerstone Church, we want all of you to be equipped we want you to be equipped to be bold, to tell out what the Lord Jesus has done for you. Part of this is we really want Cornerstone to grow, and not for kingdom, you know, our numbers' sake, but for the sake of the kingdom. In other words, we want to see growth in our midst, not because we want to see more numbers. Rather, we want to see more people enjoying the life-giving kingdom of Jesus. 
We want people to know the life that's found in him, the peace that's found in him, the freedom that's found in him. And as we've been seeing in Mark, Jesus is building a better kingdom. His kingdom surpasses all the worldly kingdoms, and so we want people to be in this kingdom of God. Now, you might be saying, okay, that sounds good, but I'm afraid to tell out what the Lord has done in my life. I'm just, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of people. I'm afraid of looking silly. I'm afraid of being rejected. You know, I really wrestled with this thinking this past week. And this is what I want you to hear from that thinking. I'm not certain that you all have fear. I'm wondering if you have forgetfulness. I'm not certain you have fear. I'm more concerned that we have forgetfulness. What does that mean? You know, we look at this man who is possessed by demons, and he's freed, he's healed, he's radically changed, and we say to ourselves, you know what, it makes sense that he has something to tell out. He's radically changed. How could you not go out and tell the world what God has done? And so we look at this man and we say, well, of course, of course. But for me, my story is so pale. My story is so boring. My story is so non-powerful. And I just want to say to you, really? Is that what you really believe about what Jesus has done in your life? Now, if you are here and you're a Christian, I'm going to speak to you. What were you before you were a Christian? Now, you might, might be saying, is this a trick question? It's not. Uh, what were you before you were a Christian? Very obviously, you were not a Christian. The problem is, is when we say that, we don't see the seriousness of that. We don't see the gravity of that. Um, let me just give some context here. In John chapter 8, this is a passage where Jesus is having a confrontation with the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and they get into an argument basically saying, who's your daddy? <laughs> and uh, he says, you know what? When you have faith, when you believe upon God, God is your heavenly father. But you know what? When you don't have faith, the devil is your father. He basically says there's really only two kinds of people. There are those who belong to God and there are those who do not. Those who belong to God are called Christian. Those who are not, the Bible calls them anti-Christian or anti-Christ. Let me give another one. Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul talks about our salvation in this term. He said, you were living in a kingdom of darkness. You were living in a kingdom of darkness, and when Jesus came, he not just kind of like threw you a life preserver. The language there is he literally, he rips you out of that kingdom of darkness because you wouldn't come on your own. And then he puts you into the kingdom of light and the kingdom of love. That's who we are before we're Christian. We are those who are living in darkness. And someone might say, okay, I get that, but I was raised in the church. You know what, I never knew a day that I was not Christian. Yes, you know, there was a time when I was not Christian because I believe in original sin, and I was born in sin. I believe in total depravity. I believe that all people need Jesus, but I can't remember being saved. My story is this. I was raised in the church. I want to pause there and say, you know what, that is the best testimony in the whole world. That is the best testimony. So if you're a young person, you're saying, what? <laughs> if you are raised in the church and you never know a day apart from Jesus, and you can say, I've always been Christian, that is the best testimony because that is a testimony of your parents, your church, raising you in the kingdom of life and of light. Why would you want anything different? So then what do we do with this? It's remembrance. Do you remember what you would be without Christ? This passage gives us a brilliant and dark example. We would be like this man. Without Christ, we are in darkness. Without Christ, we are in isolation. Without Christ, we are in fear. And not only remember what we would be without Christ, we need to remember what Christ has done on our behalf. Jesus was the one who was cut. 
He was the one who was beaten for me. Jesus is the one where the chains of my sin were put upon him so that I could be released. Jesus was the one at the cross who was isolated. At the cross, he was forsaken by the Father. At the cross, he entered into darkness for me, for you. And so now we look at this Jesus, and he's resurrected, and we see that he has overcome our sin. He has overcome the darkness. We are free in him. Friends, this is the best news. The best news. And so here's a principle. If you are a Christian, never forget the power that Jesus took to save you. This is why we call it amazing grace. You know what? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Do you believe that, Cornerstone Church? Do you believe that? And so the principle is open your mouths and tell out what Jesus has done. Open your mouths and say, I remember the mercy, and that's what I talk about. One more point, and quickly. Response to the kingdom. Look at verse 20. The man goes to what's called the Decapolis. It's ten cities, and it's a fairly large area. And what he does is, look, he, he goes and he tells how much Jesus has done for him, and then it says the people marveled. That word marvel is actually very curious because it's the same word of how the people responded when Jesus calmed the wild sea. They marveled and they said, who is this? And so it's the same type of language that's saying, when the man went out, the people were saying, is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? So here's a principle. When the kingdom comes with power and truth, you know, with changed lives, people notice. People always notice. Now you might be saying, I'm curious, why didn't you talk about the demons begging to go into the pigs? I'll do that right now. <laughs> why did he do that? Um, why did the demons want to go into the pigs? Perhaps to stay out of the abyss, uh, to stay in the area, perhaps to harm the reputation of what Jesus is doing. We don't really know. It's not in the text, clearly. Why did Jesus send them into the herd of pigs? Because he didn't like pigs? Um, probably not. Um, very simply, it wasn't time for final judgment. But guess what? It was a powerful sign. It points forward to the abyss. It points forward to what happens to evil. It is judged. And so is the display of Jesus and his great power. Let me put it very simply. It's a call to repentance. It's a call to return to Jesus. And so again, if you are not a Christian today, will you believe upon Jesus and follow him as Lord. And if you are a Christian, do you see the power of Jesus? The power of Jesus to save us from the abyss. This is our story. This is our song. Praising our Savior all the day long. Doesn't matter if you're old or if you're young. This is our story. And will you tell out what Christ has done? Will you tell out the mercy he has shown you? Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have come to us. We are grateful for the salvation that you have shown. You have rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, and you have put us into the kingdom of love. Help us to remember this salvation. Give us grace to tell out how much you have done for us. Give us boldness to share with others the mercy you have showered upon us. Lord Jesus, grow your kingdom in our midst. May your kingdom go forward in Waukesha County. Grow cornerstone through people believing upon Jesus. All to your glory. Amen.